What happens in racing? The engine, the car, it ain't nothing but grief. You're battling it, you know, for months or weeks, trying to get it to do what you want to do. And finally you do or you don't get it to do it. And how the hell are you gonna love anything that costs more than a mistress that was that damn much misery? Now for Dinner with Racers, with your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Placeholder radio sound. I'm a driver, I'm very angry. The sound of a driver on the radio during a race. Hey man. How's it going? Good, good, good to see, see you again. You yeah, as well. Absolutely. So we're driving around the country, working on something a little bit different. If you were to receive some money after you might have been fined publicly from NASCAR, would you feel the need to urinate on it? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> have you ever looked at a NASCAR official and said, you're never going to find what I did to this thing? Um, I thought that, but... Um... <laughs> so with the old days of templates, have you ever thought about trying to manipulate the template itself? We would never do such a thing. Um... I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, Have you ever thrown a hammer at a NASCAR official? No, because we never cheat. <laughs> we all go through life being told to obey the rules. Don't run that red light, pay your taxes on time. And of course, always respect your superiors. But then as you get older, you start realizing that there's all different types of people. There's the rule followers, there's the rule breakers, but none of them would exist without the rule makers. Hi there, I'm a Sam Elliott type, and I'm here to tell you about the legend of Smokey Eunuch. Now, Smokey was no rule maker, and he certainly was no rule follower. But if a rule was never written, can you really say he was a rule breaker? Yeah, Smokey was uh, a lot of people's heroes and a lot of people's um, pain in the ass, I guess, because he always found ways to beat them. Whether it was engines or, you know, fuel or weight distribution, he was always a thinker and he was always an innovator. And I think, you know, our sport misses guys like that right now. I'd love to have a guy like Smokey right now. between letting the cat get away with it on the table oh, this is not, and flat out just feeding yeah, it. Yeah, you're actually feeding the cat more than you're eating yourself. <laughs> He's not talking. <laughs> so, Smokey was your dad. He was. Smokey was married three times. Um, his first marriage immediately out of the service. There were three children born of that marriage. The second, when he came to Daytona Beach, there were, again, three children. And the third and final marriage was just my stepmom in his their later years, and there were no children there. We grew up very poor in rural farm Pennsylvania. Dad was absent most of the time. His dad. Yeah. <laughs> his daddy was gone most of the time. He was a carpenter, and he was on the road making a living. His mom, my grandmother, was probably a little bit crazy. She ultimately killed herself by stepping into highway traffic. Oh, wow. Um, Mom and Dad fought like cats and dogs. Yeah. And um, after his dad was dead, he had to quit school to maintain the farm right. for a family income. There was a little bit of time when he actually served jail time because his mom threw him in jail for non-support. <laughs> Interesting times. Wow. He decided the best place for him was the service. He wanted to serve his country. Yeah. So he got a forged birth certificate because he'd been born on the farm and didn't have a birth certificate. So there was a local Catholic priest who made a little bit of money doing that. Who <laughs> <laughs> would just be like, he's 17, signed a priest. Mm -hmm. 
So he went off to the service where he yeah. um, served really all over the globe. America's army takes to the air. While more and more bombers roll off the assembly lines at high-powered factories, growing air armadas stand ready, guided by pilots second to none. Men training with bombers, with fighters, with pursuit planes. Intrepid men, learning every formation, learning to keep the air above America free. So mechanically, he's starting to make a name for himself. He's got his own motorcycle. He's built a tractor to make work on the farm easier for himself, and then decides to go and join the military. He told me I fought in every major battle from Europe to the Pacific, and he was on a training mission. I think they were down in Alabama, and his appendix burst when he was flying, and he barely got the plane down. He ends up flying in something like 50 successful missions, flying pretty much in all the, like in the Pacific Theater over Germany, and sees some terrible things, and writes about it very openly and vividly in his book. The interesting thing was, we had no idea about that. Oh. Um, he never talked about it. He came back with scrapbooks that he had created. Is there any story about the war that really stuck out to you? The part where he went to the Vatican, because he was raised a Catholic and he, around the Vatican, the streets outside, and the desperately poor people, and the beggars, and the hungry, and then you go into the gates, and it's gold, and it's opulence, right. and there's so much, yeah. and he walked away from his faith at that point. This is a swamp here. Matter of fact, across the road there where that dry cleaner is, I saw an 11 foot alligator one time when they were going to clean that out to build that building. There was probably 40 alligators in there, and that was swamp all the way down as far as you could see. So this whole thing was just a swamp. What'd you do with the alligator? The alligator uh, cut his tail off and ate it and threw the rest of it away. <laughs> One thing for Smokey for me is he embodies what the sport was in the early years. That Wild West attitude, right? That code of the West, we're going to do it this way, and if we get caught, we just get caught, you know what I mean? And then we'll do it another way, yeah. you know, and that kind of thing. And that's the way everybody was. You know, my granddad was that way, my dad was that way. When I started the Dodge team, Smokey would come up and visit me once a month and sit in my office. Oh, no kidding. And let me tell you, he was, he was like Nostradamus. So even in like the early 2000s, 40 years removed. He, he explained how the program would build up, the things that would happen, what could make it fail, what did make it fail. He was pretty smart. Now, Smokey once said that you don't race the car, you race the rule book. Even though he is self-taught, Smokey is one of the finest readers in the whole sport. There's no education cheaper than a library book. After the war, Smokey put his self-taught education, his mechanical genius, and his fearlessness for the good use out in Daytona Beach, building the best damn garage in town. Now, I'm not the cussing type, but best damn garage in town is actually what he called it. <laughs> so literally the Daytona Beach choice, which kind of became his home mm -hmm. for Adopted. most of his life, literally came from training missions when he was in the service. Yep. He had to fly a set amount of time. It wasn't a prescribed route, and it was green and pretty. And they're just like, sort of knocking off flight time. He's like, I got an hour, so let's. Yes. Oh, I'm going to live here one day. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah. yeah. Good. So. How quickly after he gets down here does he set up his own shop? Almost immediately, That's within a, a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, how quickly did he have the moniker "Best Damn Garage in Town"? From the beginning. So day one. From the beginning. Yeah. There was a time when my mom bought something from the local Catholic church and he gave her a check to go pay for it. Mm -hmm. And it said Smokey's Best Damn Garage in Town and they would not take it. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that is profane language, my that friend. That is awesome. Yeah. That's also a great way to save money. There you go. <laughs>
Here on the fast sands of Daytona Beach, speed capital of the world, long-standing records for automotive performance are smashed into oblivion before the eyes of thousands. Was it was racing always the intent? Um, survival, servicing trucks and cars was the initial intent. Yeah. But think about it, and this really strikes me. Here we are in Daytona Beach after the service, after the war. You've got all these adrenaline junkies, Bill France, uh, Ray Fox, Smokey Eunuch, Fireball Roberts, and they're all in this same place at the same time. Yeah. How did all of these people come to be right here at that particular moment yeah. in time? They didn't know they were looking for an outlet, but they were. They were looking for something exciting. Smokey Eunuch, mechanic on number three, signals Goldsmith that Turner is a threat. Now, if you're one of them folks who only looks at statistics, Smokey would go on to be one of NASCAR's great builders in the 1950s and 60s. As an owner, he won two cup championships, two Daytona 500s, and would take 50 other wins as an engine builder or a crew chief. But if you only know Smokey from a record book, you don't know Smokey. Do you have any favorite Smokey Eunuch legends that you know about? Uh, there's definitely a lot. I know they had like some type of uh, like airbag kind of deal under all the springs basically so it would pass like crank height rule and everything and then as soon as it got on track the driver could leak it out. He was one of the first ones to uh, actually use the roll cage to put uh, fuel in. He had his rear wheels covered um, at a speedway race to uh, take away some drag and yeah. after he got done qualifying he cut that that wheel well out because everybody's like, how are you going to change tires? Yeah. And the other one I thought it cool is when they actually got the motor to run the opposite way. Right. And then flipped over the rear end housing and all that. I thought that was that was pretty legit for, that's a lot of work back then. <laughs> I got to walk through the smoke, Smoky Unique building. I was simply blown away that there was so many things inside that building that you could never read about in a book right. because he never told anybody what he did unless he got caught. As far as cheating goes, they'll never stop it. The only way it can be done successfully, only one person can know about it. Smokey Eunuch. Now, we could spend the next three days talking about all the things Smokey did to win, but these boys here are on the budget, and I'm getting paid double scale. So, just to name a few of his most famous rule book gray areas. Smokey once put a basketball in the fuel tank so that when NASCAR checked capacity, it would match the rules. But then, he'd deflate it before the race. Speaking of fuel, he'd actually refrigerate it before he filled up, condensing it and allowing more to flow in. Smokey claims he was the first to reverse the rotation on an engine, causing the chassis to lean more towards the left. Heck. Some would even say he would walk around with a measuring tape for officials to use. The only problem was that tape wasn't exactly accurate. You name it, offset chassis, raised floors, rooftop spoilers, nitrous oxide. If there wasn't a rule for it, Smokey did not think he was cheating. In his own words, all those other guys were cheating 10 times worse than us. This was just self-defense. Well, shall we toast to Smokey? I think we should. We yeah. should toast Smokey, for yeah. sure. Yeah, there we go. Cheers, boys. All right. Yes, yes. And Smokey was, was one of those really, really neat people. His name really, really described him. Smokey Unique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Smokey Unique, I'm telling you. Yeah. So he's got this new Impala that no one knows about. So, cross paths with him really early. I was trying to get my stuff going and having reasonable success on the short tracks. We're at Charlotte, and I get in the car, and the car drove really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had driven a lot of bad driving stuff, modified driving yeah. for somebody, yeah. somebody else's modified or whatever. It's smoky unit, like it, it can't it be, be that great. bad, right? Yeah, exactly. And so I wasn't going near as fast as Smokey was sure the car would go. Sure. And we're standing there, and Leroy Yarborough walks up, and he's Smokey. Well, that car really looks good. He says, no, Bobby just ain't driving the car good enough. Why don't you let me try it? 
Oh. Oh. So Leroy gets in the car and he goes out pit road and he comes around and he comes by one time, and back around, and as he's getting off of turn four at Charlotte, he gets that thing in the wall and he starts going over and oh, over. He's rolling and, the thing. I wow. mean, destroyed <laughs> every <laughs> square inch of that car. <laughs> My relationship with Smokey was, I'm going to have to say, more of a personal one. Okay. Yeah. Did you know his reputation before you met him? Oh, <laughs> yes. Everybody <laughs> in the world knows Smokey. you got to be good. That's the, that's the question of the whole night. <laughs> so, Gee. so what, what was the reputation like? That, I mean, I, everyone, I assume, knew him as, like, the, the craftiest guy in the paddock. But was he intimidating or was no. he? No. Yeah. Extremely quiet. Okay. Yeah. He's notorious for exploiting the rules. Does he tell you? Does he tell you, hey, look, don't get caught with this, or don't go blown by people here, or does he just say, go drive the race car? He doesn't tell you a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a thing. He can get things screwed up so easy on the handling. Uh huh. And then, just as polite as can be, hand the car to you. Have a ball. <laughs> Figure it out, kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm telling you what, that guy. So you would argue his gift was about how to make a car go fast, getting all the power you can get out of it, bending the rules, but making it comfortable for the driver, maybe not so much. When the guy dang things run like a striped ass ape, you gotta wonder, what in the world's <laughs> making that thing do that? Well, I mean, it got really bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And this was for the stock car, or, because I believe you also ran the Paul Revere in a Camaro oh, yeah. that he put together. That, that friggin' thing was fast yeah. from the time he'd get up in the morning. Okay. I mean, the Camaro that, that yeah. he put out there? When Sp Smokey ca calls on this telephone in this house, he never tells you what you're going to do. Okay. He just says, feel like running a race? Sure, Smoke, what do you got? Well, I don't know. Just come on down. We'll look it over. <laughs> <laughs> come on down to Daytona. <laughs> From Albuquerque. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I mean, he does that religiously. Yeah. You sight unseen, you buy a ticket, you show up at a racetrack, no idea what you're walking into. No idea what car it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead serious. When we started that Paul Revere race, I'm on the, I'm, I'm, I'm the last car on the back straightaway. No qualifying for me because the qualifying was transmission was in the wrong place. Uh, uh, so that's why you're in the back. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Tell you what I did. I started totally at the back of the back. On the back straightaway. That's where the starting line is for that race. Don't ask me why. Okay. So I go down that back straightaway and I see I see just all the dust swirl up mm -hmm. up front. front. And I said, well, that's it. Let's go. <laughs> so I nailed that son of a gun. And do you know, you know where number three turn is yeah. at Daytona? I'm leading it by then. <laughs> <laughs> totally in the lead. So like 300 yards, yeah. you're already up front. But yeah. not by just a little bit. <laughs> I am hauling ass. Fireball Roberts in a Chevrolet wins the Southern 500. On to the winner circle. Fireball Roberts, last year voted NASCAR's most popular driver, is one of the five men who have competed in every Southern 500. <laughs> Fireball was a extremely talented athlete, and there are many people who believe that he was NASCAR's first rock star driver. You couldn't touch him at Daytona. Right. He was really, really good, and he had charisma, and he had charm. When Fireball ended up, you know, succumbing to his, his injuries, did 
anything change with Smokey? No, um, but it made him more resolute in in safety. Uh -huh. That was pretty much the end of his NASCAR racing as well, because right. he wanted he used a, f a fuel bladder that was taken from airplanes yeah. from the war and France wouldn't allow that in NASCAR and that was one of the last big blow-ups between the two of them you remember what happened to Fireball I'm not going to be a part of that anymore a man marches to the beat of his own drum it's not uncommon for him to defy authority but when he feels authority's messing with his family you best be prepared for what you just unleashed and for Smokey, the greater the frustration, the larger the antagonism. Now, I'll tell you right up front, the last I knew of Bill France Jr., he would have had to went to fourth grade for three more years to get an idiot's license. But what's happened here now is that he's controlling a billion dollar business very successfully. So apparently, since I last had anything to do with Bill France Jr., he got educated. I'm a broken man with nothing left inside. Every sport needs showmen, and you've got to have that, that person, whoever it is. And these guys didn't like him. You know, the Richard Petty's and the David Pearson's and the Kelly Arbors, they didn't like him because he went against the grain. In that beginning, it was the Bill France show. It was his show. You're not supposed to be bigger than him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's just the way it was. I'm, I'm sorry. That stubbornness where that alpha dog deal, like it, it wasn't really about being an alpha dog. It was about, hey, building a series, right? So I, I think that there was still some competition there, the way Smokey felt like it should be, without really understanding what Bill Sr. was trying to do. And they just didn't like each other. Way in the early deal, Bill France proposed this big new speedway and da da da, -da and needed some investors. And Smokey Unic went in debt to get money to invest. And then Big Bill bankrupted that corporation. Oh, cost Smokey his money. Yeah. Okay. Smokey felt like Big Bill owes him that money to the day he died. If you're gonna play with rattlesnakes, you better know what rattlesnakes do. The France family seemed like they were almost developing a culture of just they're in charge, you're going to do papers for them, but that's it. No, they don't know anybody anything. Yeah. So a, a guy like Smokey, as a source of pride, doing everything he can to go against them, mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine that went well. You know, I thought to myself time and again, Smokey, shut up and sit down. <laughs> yeah, right. Somehow you can get that horsepower, you prove that to, to the world. Right. Let's say he shows up with, a, they have their, you know, 11 point checklist of all the things he needs to fix. If he'd maybe only done half of those things, if he might have not had as many problems in terms of getting checked out. Oh yeah. We used to have this stupid saying uh, that the magic happens in the shadows. It's like my love that, life. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I can relate to that. While Smokey was the light and drew the light, these other guys were getting it done too. Yeah, right. right. You know what I mean? When you challenge authority and put a role out that you're smarter than them, it's an uphill battle. But if you're the poor guy from New Jersey, who works I, right? for Hendrix. Yeah, and and uh, <laughs> everybody plays a game, you know, and everybody plays a game differently. But I've learned a lot more by not telling people how much I know. After about 15 years of bumping heads with the powers that be, Smokey had begun to have enough of NASCAR. And NASCAR had, had enough of Smokey. With Chevrolet officially out of racing in the mid-60s, Smokey saw an opportunity to build a car without any interference from the bigwigs in Detroit. And sure enough, when he showed up with his own Chevelle for the 1967 Daytona 500, Driver Curtis Turner, who famously failed to start a NASCAR driver's union, took the pole, only to break down mid-race. A few weeks later in Atlanta, the car was burned down. However, one year later, Curtis and old Smokey be back at Daytona, this time with the most legendary car in NASCAR history. Was that a thing where he could just arrive and no one 
kind of knew what to expect or what was going on. Everybody was in, on their own deal. Yeah. <clears throat> until all of a sudden here smoking. And was he like the one guy that when he shows up, everybody's like, oh no, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no Chevrolets entered from the factory. Right. So a privateer with a Chevy, if they're going fast, the big, big manufacturers aren't going to be happy about that. It was a problem. And so they went to Mr. France and said, if you let him run, then we're going to pull our ad money. And Smokey had already been to France and said, this is what I'm going to bring. Are you going to let me run? And he said, yes, I'll let you run. Smokey shows up and gets in a big tussle with the NASCAR inspectors over they find 11 things wrong with his car, including they want to relocate the way the chassis is mounted to the body. Mm -hmm. And all 11 things, Smokey, you got an hour and a half to fix. And he decides he's going to leave with the car, and they say, well, you can't leave the car. And they have the fuel cell or the gas tank pulled out of the car, and he just drives away anyway. Without the fuel cell. Without, without the fuel cell. <laughs> He was pretty mad when he cranked that car up with no gas tank and drove it. Yeah. 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 And that's a real story. That's not some urban legend that continues yeah, no. to get bigger. Yeah. Like you were there. It happened. When a person gets told that there's over a dozen things on their race car that they have to fix, they never come back. The tales about that car have a way of becoming larger than life. So, the 7-8 scale car, are you familiar with that story? A little bit. And do you think that was real? Yeah, I believe that was real. Now, some say that Chevelle was built to a perfect 7-8 scale. Others say that he kept the car's profile, but found a way to cut it up and narrow it. But then there's some who claim that it's just actually stock dimensions, but it's just very finely tuned. Hey, Mark, how are you? Hey, Doing all right? Nice Good to meet you. you. Yeah, nice thanks, Jim, for having us here. I'm assuming that's it right there. Yes, that oh, is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So is this something you always wanted? The smoky car, well, we, Lynn and I, my wife, we actually like vintage stock cars. Yeah. We follow all the stock car stuff and we like to drum brake cars especially. And obviously this is an iconic car. Never ever thought we'd even have an opportunity to own it when it came up. So can we take a look? Oh yeah. Awesome. Okay. When you uncover it like we just did, are you like yeah. Yeah, they're just they're being just so much on the car. I mean, it's every time I've owned the car, like I said, for 19 years, yeah. and there's always something new that we discover. On the car, there's kind of there's so many things, but we can just start with the bumper. The front bumper mm -hmm. is is actually an air dam, so to speak. It's it's been widened, uh -huh. it's been lengthened. All those lines, you know, the doors, everything's been molded over like the moldings. Right. They're smaller. And then also what he's done, he actually created another <laughs> that goes up. That's awesome. So, and then everything in the car, this, this whole seat and everything's shifted to the left. Mm -hmm. So everything is moved far left oh, as possible for, for weight distribution. Here's the fuel line. <laughs> <laughs> is that crazy? Um, I'm not sure what size it's supposed to be. Wow. But this is... Uh, Here's the, what it's supposed kidding. to be. This That's... is it right here. What am I looking at here? You're looking at a 66 Chevelle that raced in the Grand National Stock Car class that did very well, raced for a number of years, built by a very qualified person, you know, Bobby Allison. Oh, so the comparison should be that these are both cars from that same era. Same era, and they should be similar. So this, this actually is very similar to a stock 66 okay. Chevelle. Smokey sectioned that thing and then added two inches to it to kind of make an air dam out of the bumper. Okay. Whereas this is production, that is 250 hours of labor. First thing I noticed when we took this up, you have this like plate right up on the front and Smokey's is like, looked like it's been bent properly in a press. And then this one looks like it was just cut to fit. Absolutely. I mean, and that, look at all the compound angles. You got an angle here, you got an angle yes. there. That's just two pieces of aluminum. Right. He probably spent 
I don't know, 15, 20 hours right. on that. Where that one probably the guy did it in an hour and a half. Yeah, exactly. This front fender to door yeah. to A pillar gap is right. huge, especially yeah. the door to A pillar. Sure. Whereas this one, you can barely even see it. I mean, it's tighter than a new car and almost almost painfully tight. Like as a body man, you'd worry you're going to blow the paint off right, because it's so darn door, tight. Yep. And like even this seam here, that right there, you can see where the fender actually has two pieces between the A pillar and the thing. He's leaded that whole thing in. One of the cool things for the, for the more casual ob observance is this is actually made into an airfoil, this actual bottom link here on the, on the Watts link. Yeah, I mean, this looks like it came off of the front of an Indy car. Like a modern Indy car yeah, looking, which is as far as that. Really cool. It's also got a pickup for the air that goes to the squirrel cage, then blows the air, you know, oh, yeah, just it's, catches it's, air and it's, speeds it's, it up. Exactly. Yeah. And then it just dumps it out here right out the back is what he's wanting. Yes. Whether it was the hundreds of hours spent just on the bottom of the car, the insane amount of attention into detailing and refitting the rear end, the spoiler, or even the fact that the entire car was offset to the left, a person could spend four days looking at it and not learn everything that he's done to it. But the world really just wants to know one thing. Was this a 7-8 scale car? Smokey Chevelle has a lot of myths about size and shape and things like that. And one of our things we wanted to do is we really wanted to measure it. So that's a 66. This is a 67 with a 66 front end. Right, correct. But they're supposedly... Should be the same. The yeah. same. Okay. Should be the same. So if we measure them, they should be, in theory, the same. Pretty close. Yeah. You've never done this before? Never measured them. What are you doing, man? I just look at them. You can tell <laughs> the difference by looking at it. Corner of the bumper to the corner. Is that it? I got six feet three and a half. Okay. Six feet two, but a totally different shape. Five foot four. Five foot four, exactly. Okay, so pretty identical. Spot, pretty spot on. Yeah. Four foot ten and a half. Okay. Four foot eleven and an eighth. Okay. Because again, he's pulled the drip rails on that one in. Yeah. Sixteen feet one and a half. 16 feet, one and three-eighths, one and a half, one eighths. So obviously we've kind of measured the four corners, so to speak, but you can look and see that this thing sits way lower, and so far nothing's really shown up. So let's just go with right height. Two foot eight and three-eighths. Cool. What do you got? Two feet, ten and a half. Yeah, look at that. So that's something different. That's, a, that's yeah. quite a lot. Four foot five. Four foot five. Four foot two and three quarters. Man. So there's two and a quarter right there. So we're looking at about two inches average. Two to two and a half inches on Lower. the right height. So it sounds like he had, you know, a pretty consistent drop across the whole thing of about two inches roughly. Yeah. So basically getting this thing two inches lower, getting it smoother, fabricating all the things he did. It can seem like it is a lot smaller because even right when we walk in the door, but it it's just not. looks drastically different. Yeah, right? but it's not a 7 8 scale car. No, not at all. How do you feel about us, you know, measuring the car and finding out that it's not 7 8 scale? I think it's great. I mean, it's, uh, I kind of knew that. Smokey told me that when I talked to him on several occasions. You knew the whole time? Yeah, I knew the whole time, but you guys had to measure it to make sure, so you can't trust me, right? <laughs> well, Smokey's never told a lie before. Never. So. Right. That's right. Rumor has it that the way that that 68 race went down, that Big Bill did apologize to Smokey and did try to make it right, and allegedly Smokey threw a hammer at him when he showed up to apologize. I wouldn't doubt that at all. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't doubt that at all. After the hammer throwing incident didn't work out, the next legend goes that he sent him a check since and he wasn't able to make any money. And, and the check was returned with special editions. Uh, Clarify, please. 
He took the check to the bathroom with him. (laughs) (laughs) Made a deposit. for speeds of 90 miles per hour. Now, 175 miles an hour is within reach. Smoky Unit experiments with an airfoil. If you look in 1969, look at the 33 cars, I don't think there's any two that are alike And even where you've got the same make, they're all slightly different because the crew chief on that one said, let's try this or we'll hang this on. He loved Indianapolis because it allowed his creative mind to run. He called it the little skinny rule book because NASCAR had all of these rules and regulations, but Indy said it has to be this long, it has to weigh this much and go at it. You're running as fast as you do here. It's like running down the edge of a razor. The minute that track changes in temperature, a little grease gets on it, a little oil. The race tracks, they're like broads. They change every five minutes. So you guys have two smoky unit cars here in the museum. Yes, the outlandish one is the sidecar. When you see that design, you think, what the heck was he thinking? Right. You said originally that was gonna be a turbine, and then that didn't work out for right. whatever reason. So he entered the thing with no driver, and then he said, Bobby Johns, he said, Smokey called me. Then he said, I couldn't get to the airport fast <laughs> enough. So he took it out for a, for a test stop. But you think, boy, you must really want to do this bad to drive this thing, because it's just, you're just, sitting out there and uh, you're on the inside but if you do a 180 and hit the wall the engine was right next to your right ear and then I I haven't looked at the car for a while but there's like 102 gauges and I think are you supposed to drive around and And then look look at the gauge right oh god so the other car here is the Jose Johnson special Yes. yes it's an eagle with a Chevy with twin turbochargers. They had a hotel, they had a resort. Was it Quito, Ecuador? Just for a joke, instead of Howard Johnson, they called it Jose Johnson. And that's what wouldn't be politically correct right now. (laughs) So basically the car didn't have any real sponsorship. No. And so they put their hotel that they liked to visit in Ecuador on the car. And it was the joke name they made for it. Yes, yeah. (laughs) So in 1975, the race was stopped because of rain, mm-hmm. and they, they ended up 13th. They were several laps behind, but they were still running. So how long after he basically stops the NASCAR career did he continue to run you know, Indy cars and focus on that? About eight more years. Okay. It's a whole different spirit. It's a whole different atmosphere. They were welcomed there. The sponsors and promoters and everybody involved with the Speedway was glad to have them there and came out and greeted them and what can we do for you? And, and this wasn't treatment he got in, in stock cars. Oh gosh, no. Oh gosh, no. Was that just the nature of Indy at the time? They wanted this, they wanted the tinkerer and they I wanted think so. the, the, to burn the rules. I think so. I said, go get him, Bill. I, uh, I've had enough of, uh, I can't stand all the millions I'm making with you. I've already had about seven years uh, working for nothing, going from Daytona Beach to Lincoln, Nebraska to $500 to win, that kind of fortune making. So, <laughs> and uh, I had discovered uh, women and whiskey, and it, the racing was really interfering with my social life. <laughs> Just because a man's giving up racing, don't mean he's giving up inventing. So you have to smoke his last race. Well, you can't keep a genius down. 
Whether it was multiple trips to Ecuador to find oil, or no less than nine patents moving the industry forward, which would include patenting a soft wall that came 20 years before the one we know today, or the constant articles in popular science and Circle Track magazine. Or how about just defying physics by building a Fiero that ran at 50 miles per gallon, utilizing nothing more than hot vapor. And this is the famous oh, smoky yeah. hot vapor car, the 86 Pontiac Fiero. They got 52 miles to the gallon. Only thing the engine ever sees is vapor. No wet fuel ever sees the engine. There's where you really get the power. And he was doing this just to prove that the concept could work? Yeah, and he did, and he took it to the EPA in Washington who, who set all the rules, you know, about, the, you know, the, we have to have a certain amount of gasoline <laughs> mileage. Well, he could give it all they wanted. Yeah. And they ran him out of Washington. They said, we don't want to hear about that. We're not interested in that. He had built this machine in secret and had it in a room that was just keyed by him. Mm -hmm. That's a 200 horse electric motor, 400 volts. It takes a special transformer. Wow. And the NASCAR engine goes right there. And this motor will turn that engine up to 8,500 RPM with the ignition off wide open throttle. Wow. So everything, the motor's passing the fuel through it. Mm -hmm. It's doing all of that. Then Smokey would take it off the machine, take the engine apart and make little changes to it, put it back on, see if he decreased or increased the parasite drag. Wow. This is where all the lightweight oil was developed that we all enjoy today. Came from this machine. Yeah, this was the beginning of all of that. Well, one thing we found quite interesting when reading the book is uh, there's a story about uh, receiving pleasures pleasures from a friend of his his mom at a very young age. So <laughs> you have to read this before anybody in the world ever sees it. Yes. How does a daughter react to that? Yeah, I, it's just it's smoky. It was part and parcel, <laughs> part and parcel of the package. Right. Um, he didn't change <laughs> until he was in his mid seventies. Smokey was at the first beauty contest I was in, and he got hooked up with my mother and my sister, so we became family. Hold on, why was he at the beauty pageant? Like he just happened to be there? I was, I was at the Miss Southern 500 and they were there, but him and Fireball, I think, had a thing about picking out the prettiest girls. Who right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Really and truly, I tell y'all something new. <laughs> the funniest story ever to come out of that was, this, this old lady stood up in the back of the room. This is years ago. And what they would do, they had a roving mic. This question's for you, Smokey. I want to know what a good-looking woman like Margie, who was sitting right there on the front row, the second wife, sees in an old fart like you. And Smokey says, come on up, ma'am. Come on up here to the stage. And she just starts right up there, you know. He says, when you get up here, we'll step behind this backdrop and I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> he was really get into the good time. Yeah. Like we'd go around and see some girl come up. He'd expect her to know him. Uh, this sounds really mm -hmm. familiar. Well, that's just the way it has to be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thing Smokey tried to get me married all the time, you know. Oh, oh, oh boy, that's he's not a friend. He was trying to get rid of the competition, no. basically. Oh, he's trying to get you off the market so he has a chance. Well, maybe that's it. I <laughs> doubt it. Though. So, Jesus. so let's call it 1968. Single Bobby Hunter, single Smokey eunuch. You go into a bar. Who's gonna Who's gonna do the best? I will. <laughs> How did Zero. I know? Okay. Zero pause. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I, I was just kind of used to it. It was smoky, but yeah, I am aware that it's a little much. You're right. And and also didn't think it would be worth saying, like, maybe this part just doesn't need to be in the story at all because... It was his deal. That's it. And there was a rumor that went through that said we had cleaned it up. And 
I'm like, no, we didn't clean anything up. Like, right. It's 500 this is pages. The, that's yeah. pretty much it. 1100. This is the way he wanted it. And that's the way we did it. Yeah. What are you most proud of in your career, Smokey? What, is there any single accomplishment which no, comes to No, not like, really. No? no? Just a series of things? Uh, are you, as you look back on your career, are you proud of what you... Did you expect that you would have accomplished all you had? Well, I'm satisfied yeah. that uh, uh, I, you know, worked hard at it, got good at it, and I think I gave a lot back to it. And uh, I don't... I feel, in other words, I feel like when I walk down the street, I got a right to do or say just as much as anybody else in this world. I got to know Smokey in the late 90s, and I believe I was the last person to interview him alive in 1999. And for a couple of years, you'd see him, and he was like this ghostly apparition, because he'd walk around in the white coveralls that said, best damn garage in town on the back. And I asked him about some of the stories, and Finally, we got around to his health because I knew he had cancer and was sick. And he goes, ah. He said, I threw away all my medicine. He said, they diagnosed me with everything but pregnancy. He said, I threw all that crap away and I picked up 50 horsepower right away. <laughs> what were those sort of final days like in terms of, for him, was he doing everything he could to make any amends or were there any sort of unexpected apologies, anything like that? No, no. <laughs> I remember, remember, I no, said- still smoky. <laughs> I, I said he was an awesome provider and uh, just not real, real touchy-feely. He was, he was my dad and I was very much daddy's little girl. Yeah. In the last five days, he really wasn't all there. Yeah. And at the same time, you're desperately hoping for the end, for peace for him. I remember my hardest day was four or five days before he died when I realized there wasn't gonna be one of those yeah. dramatic speeches because he was gone. A guy like Smoke, he's probably got some pretty detailed instructions for his funeral. He did. I just knew that was yeah. coming. He did. He's like, I need so it to be needed. this. He wanted to uh, be cremated. He didn't want to be put in the ground. Uh, but. He was a big um, Marty Robbins fan, and he wanted the Wabash Cannonball played. as the, He wanted that played as he walked out on Indy, and that never happened, but he wanted that played at his service, and we did that. The France family said anything? No. NASCAR? Anything Maybe from? I missed the card. No. Yeah. So we're back here at the NASCAR Hall of Fame with you, and uh, you told us that you have some neat things in here that might speak to what we're working on. We have some very cool things in here. It, this is a fairly significant piece of history. Yeah. These are Smokey Unix boots from the 1967 Daytona 500. <laughs> and the big deal with that is that was the year that Curtis Turner drove Smokey's unsponsored Chevelle, right. put it on the pole at Daytona at a speed of more than 180 miles an hour, which is a five mile an hour increase in the pole speed a year before. First car to go over 180 miles an hour. So I can't help but notice, but like, I know they're on display, but that's inside the Hall of Fame. Does that mean Smokey Eunuch is in the Hall of Fame? I guess that's a semantic question. <laughs> we like to say there were people who had Hall of Fame moments. Sure. And that certainly was a Hall of Fame moment. Absolutely. Years after his passing, he's absolutely, without a doubt, should be in the Hall of Fame for NASCAR. Sure. And everyone thinks that because of the rivalry, it'll never be a possibility, even though it's voted on by people that don't necessarily work for NASCAR. Ah, but who's on the nomination committee? But, I mean, let's objectively, Smokey it was an inaugural member of the International Motorsports Hall of Fame. Yeah. He's in the SEMA Hall of Fame. He was an IndyCar Mechanic of the Year. He has accolades, just, I think there's 45 different halls of fame that he's been inducted in. It's 
fairly obvious, but if you tell me that one of my children is too stupid to pour piss out of a boot if the instructions were written on the heel, I'm gonna, that's gonna have lasting problems. I think, I think they should get over in Lawman because of his contribution to, to, to the whole picture. Right, right. So the only reason he's not in there right now is purely political, and I think everybody knows that. And I think that the new uh, regime at NASCAR is really starting to understand, hey, look, Bill France Sr., incredible visionary, but Smokey, Smokey as, as well. So I don't think that there's a person on the whole committee or any, anybody in racing that would say, hey, look, Smokey's not. As soon as he comes up, he, he's a first-round yeah. guy, right? So as soon as he can get on the ballot, and I don't think there's anybody that would argue with that. If you ask me, Smokey's accolades would merit a shot at the Hall of Fame. He's done a lot for the sport, not only uh, racing, but also just the automotive world as well. But I don't want to put that question on you because of your, you know, employed by the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Well, I, I do have a year of college left to pay for for, for my daughter. But, um... <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of strange, like around, must have been around 2000, Smokey and my dad knew each other from the 70s with Foyt. So Smokey contacted my dad, and they were talking about some things with for that vehicle. And then uh, Smokey knew that we were testing a Cadillac, I believe, at Daytona. And of course, like regular people, we invite him out to the test. And I was in my early 30s at the time, so it was pretty cool that Smokey Eunuch is coming to one of our tests, you know? So we're here at Daytona, and it's probably midday, and all of a sudden the security truck like pulls up pretty quickly. The security guy, kind of busts out of the, the truck and he, he goes, is he with you? And he points straight at Smokey Eunuch. And I go, yeah. And Smokey's like, he's an old man. He's an old man. Yeah. But, but Smokey Eunuch. Yeah. And I had the hat on the whole deal. And then um, I go, yeah, yeah, he's with me. And they go, uh, so you invited him to this test. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did. And they go, so he's a guest of, of you and you rented the track. I'm like, correct. And then they're like, so he didn't drive in here on his own. I'm like, no, no, you know, he's, we invited him here to the test. So then he drove away. So it's obvious, you know, someone was up in one of the suites and looked down and saw all this and picked out Smokey. And then, you know, then obviously went up the chain and back down the chain to this guy to come make sure that he was allowed in. I don't know what year he was banned from the Speedway, but it was really weird, really <laughs> weird. So it sounds like you read a lot of Smokey's book. Yeah, which... all of it. Actually, did uh, did some of the audio for Trish. Perfect. Okay, so a, a lot of claims, truth or not, who knows? Uh, but to you, with all the guys you've you've come across, with your own legacy within NASCAR, what do you think is more important, the legend of somebody or the truth? You know, I think the people that you're close to in your sport know the truth, right? But the legend is what makes other people want to read about you or want to learn about you. In terms of NASCAR history and, and telling stories, does the truth matter? In other words, no. the character, <laughs> yeah, thank you, okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you think the legend is more important than the truth? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I mean, we, we live in a world of legend. I mean, we never went to the moon. During Speed Week, we would have all of these people. Right. And, and right. it could be any given night. These folks came home for dinner, and they had the opportunity to have a home-cooked meal on the road. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, please don't walk on the slider. It's all, I'll, that's, I'll that's stop, one I'll stop that if that starts. Saying. Everything yeah. else is fine. Yeah. I'm, the slider. I love all of this. <laughs> Guys. I'm like the dark and the clouds on a rainy day. So obviously you've covered racing for forever. You know who uh, Bobby Rahal is, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. Awesome Great guy. IndyCar race. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with Graham Rahal? Who? Y do you know Bobby Rahal? Oh God, yeah. He's a legend. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with Graham Rahal? You know Bobby Rahal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good racer. You know Graham Rahal? No. You give me a minute, I'll tell you about the legend of Bobby Rahal. Uh, what about Graham? 
Never heard of him. Oh, oh. The, that was the cat. Body just shut that us off. That was the cat. I think it's still recording. I think we lost our... Uh, I think I can fix this. Hey. <laughs> oh, yeah. She, she killed the power to it. All right. What, what did she do? Oh, here we go. All right. It should turn on. We're on a road trip. On the next episode of Dinner with Racers. Biggest adventure yet, man. I could not agree more. I share your enthusiasm. I know, the biggest adventure we've ever done. Can I get a number 12 with no lettuce or tomato? Yeah, cool. Number 12. Medium size or do you like Medium. Medium. Okay. No lettuce, no tomato? That's right. Okay.